Greetings, my name is Nathan Hatch. I'm president of Wake Forest University. And I'd like to welcome you to the Character and the Professions Conference, co-hosted by the Oxford Character Project and the Program for Leadership and Character at Wake Forest University. This is part of an ongoing partnership to promote leadership and character development. It is indeed a pleasure to join together in this important discussion about ethical leadership as it pertains to particular professions. First, let me thank the many outstanding scholars who have devoted their time to share their insight and expertise with us over the next few days. I'm also grateful to the support from the Lilly Foundation and the Kern Family Foundation that has made this event possible. Additionally, I'm grateful for the efforts of so many who have worked to bring this conference tuition, including Michael Lamb and Kenneth Townsend, both here at Wake Forest. Dozens of offices, programs, and departments, along with the partnership of countless others, have organized and arranged for an inspiring time of learning and conversation around character and their professions. Leadership and character have been areas of interest to mine for quite some time. Forming leaders to enter into the professional world is the work of educational institutions. At Wake Forest, we have been committed to a twofold approach of preparing professionals. First, we teach skills and expertise needed to execute work at the level of excellence. Then we hope to focus on the role that individual character and virtue play in shaping the professions. A professional at some level has a moral commitment of service to the public that goes beyond the test of the market or the desire for personal profit. The ideal of the professions is that they serve the common good, the care of the infirmed, the promotion of justice and the advancement of science. Pursue the study of the law rather than the gain of it. Jeremy Gridley, the leading lawyer in Boston, advised the fledgling attorney John Adams before his admission to the bar. In our world today, we need lawyers, doctors, ministers, engineers, politicians, and business people who are superb practitioners, but also committed to the highest standards of their profession. And to broader ways, the professions are committed to the common good. In this spirit, I'm indeed grateful that all of you have made this conference a priority. I look forward to our time exploring what we can learn from one another about the character within the professions. So once again, welcome. We're delighted that you have joined us. Thank you, President Hatch, for those words and for all that you have done to make this conference possible. As some of you know, this Character in the Professions conference has been inspired and shaped by the life, work, and legacy of President Hatch. Thank you. My name is Kenneth Townsend and I'm Director of Leadership and Character in the Professional Schools and Scholar in Residence in the Law School here at Wake Forest. When we began planning this conference in collaboration with the Oxford Character Project over a year ago, we had no way of knowing that a pandemic would sweep the world and limit our ability to gather in person. While we regret that we are unable to welcome you to our campus here at Wake Forest, we are grateful that this virtual format has allowed us to reach more people than we had originally planned. As of about an hour ago, over 2,200 had registered for this conference, representing 37 countries and every continent on earth except for Antarctica. We're grateful for the excitement surrounding this conference and are looking forward to the next few days. This conference would not be possible, as President Hatch noted, without the support of a lot of people, including our funders and foundation partners. In particular, we wanna thank the Lilly Endowment, the John Templeton Foundation, and the Kern Family Foundation. It is because of their generosity that we have been able to make this conference free for you all. And we also wanna thank the 18 external partners beyond Wake Forest who have partnered with us in various ways. Thank you. Thanks also to the 36 departments, schools, 
offices, centers, and programs at Wake Forest that have partnered with us. We encourage you to take a look at the conference partner section on our registration website to see all of the people and entities who have played a role in preparing for this week's conference. Before I introduce and welcome Ed Brooks from the Oxford Character Project, I'd like to mention just a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, it is not too late to sign up for additional conference sessions. Feel free to sign up using the registration link, pass that along to others who might not have had a chance to register yet. Uh, second, for those watching now, you need not go anywhere after this introduction concludes. The same Zoom link is being used for this introduction, for the presentation from Professor Eric Bierbaum and the panel discussion to follow. If you do need to disconnect, simply go back to your email, click on the link you received to rejoin the relevant session. A third, our chat function has been disabled for the audience, but you may submit your questions to each of the featured speakers using the Q&A utility at the bottom of your Zoom screen. After each of the featured speaker presentation concludes, there will be time for audience Q&A, but there will not be Q&A after the panel discussions. Finally, thanks to the Graduate Program in Interpreting and Translation Studies, we have live interpreting services in Chinese and Spanish. For those seeking interpreting services, please click the interpreting icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Ed Brooks. Ed is Executive Director of the Oxford Character Project at the University of Oxford. His research lies at the intersection of virtue ethics, character, and leadership development. He heads up research and programming efforts at the Oxford Character Project and has designed and delivered leadership development programs at universities and organizations around the world. Ed, thank you to you and the Oxford Character Project for all that you have done to make this conference possible. Welcome. Well, thank you, Kenneth, and for that generous introduction. It's an honor for the Oxford Character Project to be co-hosting this conference along with our colleagues and our friends at the Programme for Leadership and Character at Wake Forest University. This is now the third conference we have hosted together and it is an absolute privilege to work in partnership with you all once again. I would particularly like to thank President Hatch for his opening words and moreover for all he has done over many years as an ambassador for character and leadership. In Oxford, we have benefited greatly from your work, Dr. Hatch, and have much appreciated your support. My thanks also to Dr. Michael Lamb and Dr. Kenneth Townsend, along with your formidable team at Wake Forest, for your work in organizing what is set to be an excellent conference, and to the foundations and supporters that have already been mentioned for making this event possible. The Oxford Character Project is an interdisciplinary initiative here at the University of Oxford, focusing on character and leadership development. Our empirical and conceptual research is joined to programmes that draw together diverse groups of students with the aim of cultivating wise thinkers and good leaders. We're currently undertaking a major research project supported by the John Templeton Foundation on character and responsible leadership in business, finance, law, and technology. So the theme of character and the professions is right at the center of our interest. Over the next two days, we have an incredible group of speakers and panelists. I'm grateful to them for their work and all they will bring to us. And I'm much looking forward to learning together with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Again, we're so grateful for this partnership and collaboration. So as Ed outlined, over the next couple of days, we are going to have a lot of fun, I hope, answering, exploring a few questions, such as what obligations do professionals have for advancing the public good? What distinctive virtues are most important to ethical leadership for professionals? What vices are most dangerous or tempting? How can character be educated or improved among current or aspiring professionals? How do specific institutions, incentives, and cultures form or deform the character of professionals? As we explore these questions and others, we are fortunate to have with us leading scholars from the world's top universities, as well as professionals at the top of their field whose daily work implicates these and other considerations of character. As you've seen in the promotional materials, our exploration will focus on character in public life, religious leadership, engineering and technology, medicine, business, and law. 
and we will hold a plenary session tomorrow night focused on diversity and character in the professions. And while this conference is free, we are providing continuing education credits for a small fee to those in engineering, medicine, and law. To learn more and to register for these continuing education credits, visit our registration website. So now at this point, we are just gonna transition right on into the first substantive session of our conference, Character and Public Life. So for any of you who are just coming into the Zoom meeting, who didn't show up for our Zoom introduction, let me just briefly say welcome to you as well. We are so glad that you could be part of this conference. Um, my name is Kenneth Townsend. For those just joining, I'm Director of Leadership and Character in the Professional Schools and Scholar in Residence in the Law School. I'm not gonna go through the whole spiel of the introduction, but I wanna say here as well that we have over 2,200 people registered from 37 different countries. We are so excited about the excitement for this conference and grateful to have you as part of it. Um, and on behalf of the Oxford Character Project as well, I'm pleased to welcome you formally to Character in Public Life, featuring the keynote address by Professor Eric Bierbaum of Harvard University followed by a panel of distinguished leaders and scholars from a variety of contexts who will offer their perspectives on character and public life. We do hope that you'll stay with us after Professor Bierbaum's presentation concludes to, so that you can participate in the panel conversation. Um, there will be time following Professor Bierbaum's conversation, presentation rather, for the audience to ask questions. So look for the Q&A utility at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And also for those just joining with the uh, support of Wake Forest program in interpreting and translation studies, we are offering live interpretation in Spanish and Chinese. Look at the bottom of your Zoom screen for questions or how to do that. Now it is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Eric Bierbaum. He is professor of government and faculty affiliate in the Department of Philosophy at Harvard University. He has also served as the Director of Graduate Fellowships at Harvard's Safra Center for Ethics and was the founding director of Safra Center's Undergraduate Fellowship Program. For his excellence in teaching, he received the Rosalind Abramson Award, Harvard's most prestigious undergraduate teaching award. His talk today is entitled Gaslighting, a Character Attack on Citizenship. Well, welcome, Professor Bierbaum. We're so glad to have you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Thank you, President Hatch. And I'm just grateful to the Center uh, for, Pres for Leadership and Character. This is a truly global conference. And I'm just gonna share my screen um, as we engage in this weekend together. Uh, just one moment. All right. Can you see the screen? I think you can. Um, like the center itself, thinking about leadership and character as someone who works on political ethics, it is a peak time where people think it's an oxymoronic project to devote your scholarly pursuits to combining these traits, but that's what I've done, that's what I try to do. Um, and I wanna draw a parallel to a book published by my two colleagues, Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt for five years ago, and that's How Democracies Die. In that book, uh, they argued that uh, they were gonna talk about the way uh, the, use the very institutions of democracy to gradually, subtly, and legally kill it. And they described in some ways how, how democracies die. And in this talk, I want to share parts of a book project that I'm working on with Ryan Davis at BYU, uh, a colleague who's center right, or as I am more center left, but we found a way, a common ground on this co-authored project, um, to think about, you might say, why democracies die, uh, to look at how um, we have a certain kind of manipulation that can use a core character trait of citizenship to also gradually, subtly turn citizens against themselves and their co-citizens. That's the kind of brand of manipulation I wanna talk about today. And of course, it comes from a play and a movie with Ingrid Bergman playing the star. Uh, in that movie, um, the victim comes to depend upon the manipulator in a very perverse way, uh, rather than her own capacities. And if you look at the appeal to gaslighting as a moral accusation in politics, um, it's remarkable in a data set of hundreds of millions of social media posts with colleagues looking back at 2011, uh, the concept was barely uttered in that world, in that universe. But as you watch it expand with key dates we've marked in our political calendar, uh, you can see it's really receiving something like millions of appeals every day. And so I wanna take that concept seriously. Why are people invoking something called gaslighting rather than 
deception and other kinds of traditional political terms that have been around as long as politics. Uh, one late night political commentator writes, we're constantly being told, you don't see what you see, you don't hear what you hear. Now they're saying you don't feel what you feel. And I think it's important to give a name to these kinds of moral abuse. Concepts matter, and when concepts are available, they allow us to better understand what's happening to us. So think of the concept of sexual harassment, uh, which is a relatively recent concept. Before that existed, uh, it was much harder for people to recognize that they were being subject to this kind of moral abuse. I think something is similar here, uh, that uh, this kind of manipulation has no proprietary hold by one party or the other. In fact, we've noticed in our look at that data set that both parties are accusing other members of it. And so my argument, because political theorists are not good at novelists, we, don't, we tend to reveal our punchline at the beginning, um, is that gaslighting exploits a certain kind of character trait that's essential to citizens, the kind of grit, which allows citizens to hold beliefs that are what I'm gonna call audacious. Um, and those beliefs are about their ability to act together collectively. And so my talk is going to unfold in three parts. And I use this metaphor, this analogy guardedly. But think of the viruses, uh, spike protein, and the way that it takes healthy cells and fools them by using that protein. Um, something similar, I think, is happening with gaslighting. It seizes upon what I'm going to argue is a healthy and vital trait of citizenship, this kind of optimism, believing that we can be part of social change. And it turns it against itself and a threat that is potentially existential for a democracy. Um, and that's why I, I say that the virus does present uh, a very disturbing metaphor for it. So I'm gonna first talk about how gaslighting works. I'm gonna talk about the way it targets this particular civic virtue. And then I'm gonna finally conclude with how leaders can mobilize citizens, can activate the virtue without uh, this kind of manipulation that's so disturbing. So in the movie, uh, Ingrid Bergman plays a victim who believes the lights have been flickering. That's because of her nefarious husband. Uh, but someone they respect insists they don't, they, they don't flicker. And eventually, after being worn down over time, the victim is never able to prove the lights flicker and comes to doubt fundamental sensory inputs. And note how this kind of manipulation works, right? It takes advantage of a very healthy norm of intimate relationships. You should trust your partner. Uh, an emotionally abusive partner, though, will manipulate that trust and to harm their significant other. And that's what happens in this domestic setting. And of course, the challenge of this talk is to show you that it scales to our political democratic life. But here's how it works in the intimate setting. Generally, when someone you respect disagrees with you, you should revise your confidence in your initial belief, whether they're a friend or a lifelong partner. Uh, that is a character trait uh, that actually constitutes being a friend. Uh, um, you might think that if you didn't revise your confidence when you face this disagreement, uh, you wouldn't actually be showing evidence that you were friends. Uh, but that's the point of vulnerability here in this domestic setting. You can come to lose confidence in yourself, in your judgments, in your capacities, and form a very unhealthy dependent relationship with the abuser. And so I might want to distinguish in the, in the domestic case, we all experience doubts about, uh, uh, about the world. Are we wrong? Uh, but that's very different from being in a state where we can't get to the truth, where we've lost touch with reality in a certain kind of way. So imagine, and this really is a hypothetical in this day, that you leave the house and you come to doubt whether you turned off the stove after leaving the house. Uh, let's say your memory is a bit phasey, whether you turned it off, but you typically will have other routes to check that. You might ask whether you cleaned the stove, which you remember. And if you cleaned it, that's fairly solid evidence that you also didn't leave it on before you cleaned it. And so you have a route back to the groundedness of reality. And what gaslighting can do, and this is the philosopher Kate Abramson's claim, is that it leaves us not just mistaken, but entirely without grounds, without a way to get back uh, to the groundedness with reality. It reminds me of the joke uh, of the person who's lost and comes to get directions and is told, um, if I wanted to get there, I wouldn't start from here. That's one of the treatment effects of this kind of abuse. So I wanna just introduce in this talk one term of philosophers of belief, and I'm gonna be limited how many I introduce, um, higher order evidence. Uh, and that is our evidence about our evidence. And so just very simply to illustrate it, because I think this is what gaslighting targets, this is what's unique about the strategy of the gaslighter, um, is that instead of going after particular beliefs we have in line to us about them, 
they step up a level and they target our ability to ground evidence by which we hold those beliefs. So think about in a word processor, a bash delete, uh, as opposed to individual formatting. So if I wanna convince you that the wall behind me is green, I could lie at the first order, but if I really wanna have a more pervasive impact upon your sensoriness of input of the world, uh, I might convince you you're colorblind and you would come to doubt that capacity. And so here's the formal kind of analytic description of gaslight I wanna work with. And that is an agent wrongly induces another agent to doubt their ability to respond rationally to evidence by providing higher order defeating considerations, which I'll say a bit about in a second, uh, about their reasoning capacities. And so there's a general sense in which you're not just locally reliable about a particular judgment, but you wanna convince the person they're generally unreliable. And the best way to illustrate this beyond this formulation is the Peanuts comic. In particular, uh, this particular comic inspired uh, my favorite song in the great Broadway play, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, little known facts. So Lucy says, do you see this tree? It's a fir tree. It's called a fir tree because it gives us fur for clothes, coats. It also gives us wool in the wintertime. Linus, the victim of this attempted gaslighting, says, I never knew that before, Lucy. It's very interesting. Charlie Brown, the bystander to gaslighting, says, wait a minute, Lucy, I didn't mean to interfere, but she continues, and the way up, the little stars and planets make the rain that often showers when it's cold and winter is upon us. The snow comes up just like the flowers from the ground. And Charlie Brown once again tries to stop her. Now, Lucy, I, I know that's wrong. Snow doesn't come up, it comes down. Uh, she continues, the wind blows around and looks like it's coming down, but actually she offers an explanation. She's trying to <laughs> convince him, don't trust your senses. It comes out of the ground, just like grass, it comes up, Charlie Brown, snow comes up, and Charlie Brown concludes, oh, good grief. Um, he leaves the scene, and you can hear a hollow thumping sound, which is his head hitting that very tree. So I think what's important here is that gaslighting as a kind of manipulation can affect audience members and wrong them in different ways. It has the direct victim who comes to doubt the reliability, sometimes of basic sensory inputs, but it also can wrong bystanders who feel helpless when they try to stop this kind of manipulation and the experience of futility when truth is not serving as a terminal objection, which, which is usually meant to serve, which is if you say something that's false, that usually should be enough to stop them from making claims. And I think Charlie Brown feels that powerlessness in this example. And so in the political setting, and that's the move I'm gonna make now, uh, we saw initially a claim about crowd size and a political scientist asked uh, partisans on the left and right which crowd is bigger? And they identified 15% of, of supporters uh, that were supporting Trump insisted upon uh, the crowd on the right being larger. That might be a kind of cheerleading acknowledgement. We should acknowledge that. Um, there was a question when the queen was left waiting, but in fact, we were told that uh, the queen showed up late. Uh, there's the fact that there may be uh, much lower vaccine uptake rates right now as we speak. Uh, and there's the case of the January 6th Capitol insurrection uh, where many of the insurrectionists seem to be in the grip of an alternative electoral reality. If you go through the signs and a lot of the social media footage, I think it backs that up. But it's important to report, this is a bipartisan phenomenon. Uh, partisans on both sides can be led to misrepresent some basic sensory inputs. So an example, an experimental example by a colleague, asked people effectively, what uh, is the temperature, local temperature in your neighborhood? What's it been like recently? And in the control in the experiment where they, they offer a variable, they, they prime people to think about climate change. And they find that people who uh, lean towards the Republican Party are more inclined to report a cooler environment, right, local environment. And the same thing applies on the other side, that if they prime uh, Democrat voters, they think perhaps they report a warmer climate than they otherwise experience. So here's the analogy to politics. Uh, and that's simply, I'm taking the initial formulation I gave and now applying it to a political actor who wrongly induces citizens to forego exercising their rational capacities by providing higher order defeating considerations about those capacities. And so what is a higher order defeater? Well, it's akin to what uh, we got from Lucy, where she actually, remember at that moment, takes Charlie Brown and says, you think the snow looks like it's coming down. She kind of acknowledges that sensory input, but then she corrects him and says, that, that's false. If you think about it again, you'll see actually snow uh, is raining upward. And I wanna argue that this kind of gaslighting can range over our attitudes, our emotions, our beliefs, and even our moral convictions, right? So it's, it's not just about beliefs about the world, it's about how the world should be. 
And I want to distinguish political gaslighting from mere deference or utterly familiar party cue taking, where I accept what many elites in my party argue for. Uh, in that case, you would expect if I change my attitude about a phenomenon, say I, all, I shift my views about climate change and about man-made carbonization, its contribution to it, you might think that once I've done that, I then will have some stability. I'll have something, what you might think of beliefs. Beliefs have a stickiness. But if I'm in this kind of very perverse relationship of deference, I can tack in either direction, right? Um, I have no regard for accuracy. Now, here's an objection that you might already be experiencing when you hear this analogy I'm drawing. And that is that it seems like, at least in many cases, citizens subject to the kind of gaslighting I'm describing in political life retain confidence or even exhibit hyperbolic confidence in their political beliefs. And so I wanna answer in, in two ways. First of all, I think that's true and it requires us to acknowledge that the way that confidence shifts can be radically inflated or deflated in the context of gaslighting in the, in the political realm. So there is a modification there. But I also would say that functionally, uh, even if uh, gaslit victims, ordinary citizens, express to pollsters greater confidence in beliefs, they don't seem to act like they have confidence in their beliefs because they're subject to be flipped on any given issue, on free trade, on issues regarding immigration. It seems like if they can, they can move those issues so quickly that they aren't really showing a, a confidence in the, the, the beliefs they, they, they've uh, been brought to have. And in that context, then the threat here, the, the real threat to citizenship is the following. It looks like our independent perspective is compromised by this phenomenon. Uh, the, the language that you might use is that we usher ourselves off when we're a victim of gaslighting in politics off the deliberative stage. And we withdraw from democratic politics by becoming such a supplicant to others. Now, I want to state a background condition that I think makes this environment right now a target rich environment for this kind of manipulation. And that, of course, is a polarized environment. And I think the relationship between these two phenomena, which is an active debate in American political science is the following. I think that gaslighting is very frequently the spark, uh, especially in the context of social media, but the background of polarization is the oxygen. And so if you consider the very tragic 1968 cabin fire in uh, one of the Apollo missions, and that led to killing the entire crew, that was a high pressure, pure oxygen cabin atmosphere. And all it took was a spark of a wire to set it off. And I think that this hyper-polarized environment we're in is a rich environment for this kind of manipulation. Because what it does, it pushes citizens towards what's been called directional motivation versus accuracy motivation by political scientists. So a directionally motivated individual, a citizen, uh, is not paying regard towards empirical facts. Um, they uh, are not sensitive to accuracy. And I think that's the background that makes this possible. So let's look at what is being targeted by gaslighting. I've described the phenomenon, but now in the political case, what is uh, its, its sort of core target? Because after all, you might think that there's a very, very easy way for citizens to fortify themselves against this phenomenon. And that is, uh, if gaslighting threatens to undo the connection between our beliefs and our evidence, well, shouldn't we just firmly double down and ensure that our beliefs are tightly connected to the evidence? We should be like many of my hard-nosed empiricist colleagues. The problem is that a, a central civic virtue of, of all of us is to be able to mobilize. And mobilization, I'm going to try to argue, requires at times some gap between our beliefs and the evidence. To show this, imagine if you want to climb Mount Everett or you want to complete a marathon. Each day of training, you are going to encounter possible defeaters. That is evidence that you're not going to make it. Um, and it seems healthy for you to, if you want to firmly have that belief, at least that you will not fail, and perhaps a stronger belief that you will succeed, uh, you may have to occasionally not take your doctors seriously when they say, I'm not sure if this is going to work out for you. And so what that is exhibiting is called by the philosophers Jennifer Morton and Sarah Paul grit. Um, and you might think crucial to achieving our interpersonal goals is that we are allowed, they would say rationally permitted, to raise the threshold for evidence in order to make it the belief that our success 
is, is reasonably likely, right? So when people around me say, you know, I don't, I don't know how optimistic you should be about completing that marathon, I might be able to raise the bar and say, you know, I still believe as an agent, I have a chance of completing it. And um, I should allow some slack between the evidence about my physical state now and my beliefs. So we're going to call that audacious beliefs. And uh, what they say is that it's sometimes permissible to have uh, what you might think of as overconfidence in the success that we will as individuals be successful in our projects. So think of when Han Solo is told uh, by C-3PO um, in The Empire Strikes Back, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to one. And Han Solo says, never tell me the odds. Now, I think he resists this evidence because he's worried it might lead him to abandon the project. He knows his odds are vanishingly small, but he wants to retain this project, this commitment. And so he is asking, I, to in some ways, be protected from that evidential source, or at least to raise the bar for what counts as evidence against this project. And so what we're looking for here is the analog to that, what you might call civic grit. Um, and a natural place to look uh, is the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted extraordinarily long, 381 days, even though the night before, uh, the first day of the, the boycott, the general thought, even among the group, was that it would last one day, maybe a week at best. If you look at the initial flyers and just to, to stress the logistics behind it, uh, 1955, Joe Ann Robinson mimeographed 52,000 leaflets like this, and they were distributed to 68 Black social organizations across Montgomery. And the boycott was planned to last one day officially, and it lasts almost 400 days. And once you look at the, the complexity behind it, uh, a vast carpool, net, carpool network, 325 private cars transporting passengers from 42 distinct stations and 42 uh, stations from five in the morning to 10 at night. Uh, you see the grit that was required and the overwhelming evidence that this was not gonna be sustainable for weeks or months or longer. And yet it was. Likewise, when Martin Luther King famously wrote that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. I think it's misleading to think that he's just announcing when he looks at the world and looks at the amount of racism of a structural kind, uh, that that is any that he ought to believe this view. I don't think this is simply a, a hard uh, no statement of how he thinks the world is likely to accord with future reforms. I think he's expressing a commitment to in some ways believe against the evidence or at the least to believe ahead of the evidence in front of him. And if you look at his exchange with the black power movement, rejection of nonviolence and rejection of this thought uh, that the world could bend in this way, I think you can see evidence of a mindset uh, that supports this belief. Uh, so, so this is a kind of second paradigm along with Rosa Parks and all her backers of I think paradigmatic grit or audacious beliefs of citizens. That leads me to the final question. I want to flip from uh, the victim of the citizen now to the leader, uh, which is obviously a centerpiece of this conference, and to think, ask the question of how leaders can do two things at once. They can simultaneously mobilize, but also in the process not to gaslight citizens. And I'm going to argue that it's not an easy uh, steering between these two horns, uh, but there is some evidence to think of how it might work in practice. So think about the plentiful political science that suggests that voters turn out when they have very high confidence, confidence that many of their fellow citizens will also uh, turn out. And you might think that to formulate the expression that one must have, what's the collective version of this audacious belief is something like this. The leader might say to followers, I believe that we will succeed. I know you share my confidence. They won't likely announce that it's overconfidence, but they might realize uh, that there is a sense in which it's really important um, to have uh, ethics, efficacy driven slogans like, yes, we can. And I don't think these should be passed over as cheap talk or overblown rhetoric. Uh, I think that that expression of confidence is what makes possible signals to others and what allows them to solve the classic collective action problem of citizenship. I mean, I think that just as you might think that I'm not willing on my own to go on a base jump. It just sounds too terrifying to do on my own. Uh, but if we agree that we're all going to jump uh, on the count of five, and I'm looking over for you for that signal, you're going to do it. Well, that's going to sustain my confidence. 
And so you might look at the portfolio of the protester, uh, the rallies, the speechifying marches, and you might think that that's also kind of proof of concept uh, that I want to signal uh, that we will succeed. And when the evidence looks like it's fundamentally stacked against us, the fact that I retain that, that what I've called the, the kind of civic grit um, is exactly what I have to keep doing. Uh, but notice what's happening there. This is the puzzle that we have to solve in the final section of this. Um, and that is that when you look at gaslighting and the techniques employed by the gaslighter, you might think that there is an awful similarity to the mobilizer. And I wanna show how those can be teased apart. Otherwise, uh, we might have what looks like kind of the duck rabbit problem. You look at the, you look at the drawing and you can see either one, uh, but I really wanna keep those in par apart because I think one of them is a kind of abusive citizenship and the other is a prerequisite of the kind of collective action that is behind citizenship. So that's the impetus for doing both. So here's an example of an exchange between a Latino canvasser and persuadable voters. And here's the report back from the canvasser. Um, he, he wrote that I canvassed 18 individuals who are uh, Mexicanos, Hispanos, and Asian couple, and they all opened their doors and they actually heard what I had to say. But more importantly, they were enjoying it. And they were like, okay, we're going to vote for that. It wasn't out of a jaded perspective uh, and that no matter what we say, they're going to still do what they want. It was more, I feel what you're saying. And I feel uh, in what you believe now. And I was like, yes, it's important that we believe that we have the power to make changes instead of feeling like we're going to be continuously be inferior to everyone else. So I take this as a kind of paradigmatic exchange where a mobilizer uh, is trying to exercise leadership by convincing individuals that not just you, but your neighbors can do this. And if once you view yourself as a collective, as jointly acting, uh, you can really realize that this is something that we can do. If it's first personally expressed, I mean, I can do, it's likely to be, to be futile. And so if what leaders need to do is cultivate that shared sense of collective self-efficacy, the civic grit that I talked about, what are they allowed to do? What are they allowed to say? So if you imagine, we kind of cut off the conversation. Hypothetically, let's imagine two further conversations that could happen at the door between the canvasser and the canvassee. And here's the one that I think is an example of welcome mobilizing. We imagine the canvasser talking about ways that the speaker and the listener can make a difference through exercising their capacities in ways that would help them realize ends they selected themselves, that they kind of own, and in ways that demonstrate their equality to other members of the political community. So that may create a genuine slack between the beliefs of candidacies and the evidence that they are going to succeed. Um, the shocking political mobilization led by, uh, by Abrams was not expected by the world. Uh, and that some of the scripts did look like this. But here's how mobilizing can go wrong, and I think become much closer to or constitutive of gaslighting. Imagine instead that the mobilizer cites their leader and the interlocutor shared loyalty to a specific individual, uh, creating that dependent relationship, focuses on the efficacy of the leader rather than on the efficacy of the leader and listener together, and insists upon the importance of excluding or defeating political enemies rather than on the leader's positive agenda. In the second case, I think, the speaker might still be actively participating in politics, but the sense of efficacy in the first instance is imputed to another agent. It's not about your power as a citizen, it's about the leaders. And uh, especially at the end where they're squashing uh, political enemies, they're viewing them uh, as simply obstacles in the way not to be reasoned with, not capable of changing their mind, um, it strikes me as, as quite close to the characterization of gaslighting I've given you. And if you look, uh, as I've done with my co-author, at the 30, 30 or so fireside chats by FDR, um, they actually don't always look like fireside chats. Uh, the fireplace is never really lit, uh, but they begin in the way that we're familiar with. Roosevelt is building trust behind uh, the banking crisis. Uh, but as those advance, and I'm not going to play the whole clip, um, but I think the intimacy of the radio is crucial here. 
Um, and I think Twitter mimics that and social media mimics that sense of intimacy. There's Roosevelt in the background. But let me just tell you what happens. By the 25th, 26th later fireside chats, I think Roosevelt moves very, very powerfully from mobilizing the American electorate to something much closer to gaslighting. He starts to spend a lot of time talking about money changers, profits of evil, big chiselers, fifth columnists in the press to, for his charges against the fake media, fake news, he, you might say today. Um, he talks about people who should not be trusted because they're selfish men, jealous men, fearful men, and poison peddlers. And, and the list goes on. But he devotes so much of the speeches later to undoing the standing of others, to, to give testimony, uh, that I think he really does show us a kind of evolution in the, in the wrong direction. And it, you can see that when you contrast it with the inaugural one, which is very much the mobilization that you might take to be crucial. So I would now distinguish two ways in which uh, gaslighting, as I've described it, is actually quite different from run-of-the-mill demagoguery. And I think they're different if you look at what is called by computer hackers as surface attacks. There are different kinds of surface attacks at stake. Um, in my, one of my favorite political novels, All the King's Men, uh, there's a portrayal of uh, a very thinly veiled Huey Long, gov the governor, and his demagoguery is alarming, but I want to argue it's not an instance of gaslighting. Um, the way he electioneers manages to bypass the beliefs of the audience altogether. And let me just give you a, a short uh, clip of what he's trying to do. This is uh, the statement of what, what politicking is about, according to Willie Stark. Just stir them up. doesn't matter how or why. And they'll love you and they'll come back for more. Pinch them in the soft place. They aren't alive, most of them. And they haven't been alive for 20 years. So it's up to you to give them something to stir them up and make them feel alive for just a half an hour. That's what they've come for. Tell them anything. But sweet Jesus sake, don't try to improve their minds. And so what is happening here um, is that there's a statement of a kind of manipulation that, of course, is, I think, destructive to democratic citizenship, but it involves entirely bypassing the beliefs that individuals have. It's a kind of entertainment demagoguery. And it's important to note that this demagoguery is typically done with a microphone and a larger group. It's not done with the intimacy of the radio or Twitter. And I think that's an important way of separating um, kind of classic moments of demagoguery from what I'm describing here, because the at least faux illusion that one is in an intimate relationship with the gaslighter is a crucial prerequisite for it to make sense. And that's quite different with the formality, especially in the case of Huey Long, of the demagogue. Look how he's putting his finger in his pocket and he has that mic. It's, a, it's just a fundamentally different setting. And it's, it's, I want to argue, a different kind of manipulation. And so I want to end this section uh, by distinguishing now uh, three kinds of manipulation. I think that deception is a form of manipulation, but showing how they're different in politics. Uh, obviously, I've talked about the lie uh, as a kind of first order attack. I can go, af go after particular propositional claims that you hold. And I argue the gaslighting can be more effective in a perverse way than the lie because it does a batch delete, right? It's able to convince you if you're colorblind, if you ought not trust this um, particular source, a news source or a broad swath of it, I can lead you to uh, much more powerfully change how you are connected to the world than a simple series, a string of lies. And also, and I use this term technically by Harry Frankfurt bullshitting, uh, is the individual, and not unfamiliar in electoral politics, who's simply indifferent to the truth. Uh, they will use it when it supports uh, their, their aims, uh, but they will run against it and lie when it doesn't. That also is occurring at the level of propositions. What's happening here, this is why I introduced the idea of higher order evidence. The gaslighter is able to manipulate reality uh, because they're looking at supporters and getting to tell them, subscribe to this follower, unsubscribe to this follower. I can tell you who to ascribe authority to and who not to. And the subscription model on social media is a way of doing that, producing a kind of customized news flow uh, that, of course, further reinforces the manipulation that I've felt. And the threat here is by going after this higher order attack, kind of higher order surface attack, you might say, that the gaslighter is able to threaten not just the individual perspective of the citizen. Remember, I described before that they would usher themselves off the deliberative stage 
but collectively make the idea of appealing to a common good a kind of category mistake, right? Uh, that we don't just take ourselves to have an important position that we need to present to politics. We take ourselves to be part of at least the possibility of a good that reaches beyond us, to be part of something bigger than ourselves, we like to say. And the common good, uh, as I've argued in print elsewhere, is a kind of way of acknowledging that there are some things that we ought to do together. And it wouldn't be the same if they were done by some third party doing them for us. And you might think that gaslighting can threaten that collective position, uh, the we of politics uh, that are trying to aim for a common good. I don't think you need to assume that there's that we all serve as a kind of group agent. Um, I just think you have to think, if you think about the common good, that we have the possibility of acting together on some important shared ground. I wanna conclude by presenting what I've shown you uh, as a kind of dilemma with two horns that bring out the stakes of this, because I think that's really important to end with. The first horn uh, that you face when you're a citizen is that you can allow considerable slack between your beliefs and the evidence. And that does make us susceptible to mobilization. I think that the Montgomery bus boycott would not have been possible if followers and activists didn't allow for that possible slack. The evidence was so stacked against them that as I said, they thought it was going to be a one day protest. It's over 380 days. Um, so even there, they weren't audacious, audacious enough in thinking what they could have done together. But the second horn is always gonna be there when we're trying to sort of act on the virtues of citizenship. And that is that if we form beliefs in a hard sort of empirically hard headed way or, or hard nosed way, and we protect ourselves from the gas lighter, it looks like by fortifying in that way, we make it harder for ourselves to view ourselves as acting together, as having hope, and we could create a kind of hopelessness, right? And if you think that part of citizenship, part of a felt need of being a citizen is seeing our agency in our state institutions, seeing our agency in the organizations to which we belong, uh, then this is a powerful threat, right? Um, that if we close ourselves off from the kind of grit or audacious belief that I argued for, we may well make ourselves unavailable to be part of movements that reform our home institutions. So you can think of citizenship as having um, a feature and a bug in the same way, right? And I think that's what we wanna bring out. The bug uh, is our susceptibility um, to being told by uh, a certain kind of manipulator who we should believe and whether we should discount in a batch way others and often others as part of the other party or a group that's been demonized. Uh, but the feature of that, our ability to believe things that, that the evidence is profoundly against is just as key. And I haven't resolved that. I think that I view this as a kind of standing challenge uh, that we face uh, as, as citizens. But I also think that that standing challenge reveals that in the ideal of citizenship, there is the exploit, which makes us vulnerable, but there's also the kind of positive counter resources to guard against it. So you might see our standing challenge is to remain open to the bully pulpit, to the persuasion of, of TRs, of FDRs, at least in the earlier fireside chats when he wasn't turning towards, I think, unduly manipulative techniques, um, but also being vigilant against the bullying. And it's a certain kind of bullying, right? And I would say it's an epistemic bullying. That is, it bullies us about not just what our beliefs are, but are they grounded? Why do we hold them? And uh, that's why you'd have to call it it's epistemic bullying, not a, a pretty term, uh, but one that I think characterizes what gaslighting is fundamentally about. Um, and so that's what I've tried to describe here. Gaslighting is a character attack and it does threaten institutions, uh, but it does it indirectly through ordinary citizens. So just as I said early in the beginning, uh, that what the description of how democracies die focus on the institutional story. Here, we're trying to focus on a different kind of story, why democracies die by looking at the, the core traits of citizenship that we all have and we aspire to. And so I offer not a, a sort of happy uh, conclusion to how we should think about it, but a puzzle that I leave uh, all of you with that I hope we can think about in the panel and the Q&A uh, after this talk. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Professor Beerbaum. What a fantastic talk. I mean, this was really, really interesting. Thank you so much, Eric. We do have some questions that have started to come through. So if it's okay with you, I think we're just going to jump in and uh, start working our way through them. Uh, the Q&A box is open, so feel free to put those in. If you haven't had a chance, we're going to get to as many of your good questions uh, as we can. Again, thank you, Eric, for this really engaging and relevant talk. Uh, so the first question is from Tom Jennings, and it goes as follows. I, I believe Max Weber wrote a book called The True Believer. Are there people who are more vulnerable to being gaslighted? And if so, how can we bring them back to reality? Yeah, that's beautiful. And of course, the, the flip side of Weber, right, is the charismatic leader. Uh, and at times, his description of that uh, can look like that. Other times, the charisma is, is much much more rhetorical, but it doesn't imply manipulation. But I like flipping it to the uh, different different ways we believe. I think that's right, that within any political movement, you actually want, I, I believe there ought to be, and we, we usually think this intuitively, a diversity of um, postures. So you, you actually want to have in your political movement, whether it's for the right or the left, people who are uh, more closely hewing to the evidence, the kind of realists among you, right, who say that's not going to work, that's not going to cut it. You want others who are the dreamers, right, who are able to hold audacious beliefs, even when the evidence is staring them in the face, maybe they're in a, in a row and they see the, the tear gas that's about to be fired, and they, they hold on to that belief that there's some, there's some story, there's some path by which we succeed. So I think that there's a division of labor among any movement, whether it's institutional or otherwise, that we want. And so that's the puzzle here is whether you can help solve the uh, dilemma I ended with by saying, well, we can't solve this as individual citizens, but what we can do is form a coalition that has both sides. So some of us will be more tempted uh, by, by this manipulation I described because that we will be uh, vulnerable in that way. Others will fortify us, help us uh, as allies and say, I think this is a case where you're not being mobilized, you are being gaslit. And, and so I would argue for the more collective solution, right? This diversity of roles and defending that uh, division of labor. And I'm trying to do that with Ryan in the larger book manuscript. Uh, but I also think, I know individual citizens want to ask the question, what do I do if someone I know um, has, has gone down this route? And people often describe it as conspiracy theories, but actually I think many cases, there's no theory, right? Um, and in fact, it's much more a story of emotional and abuse by uh, party elites. And so I also wanna have an answer that's more individuated, not simply, well, we have to do this as a collective in a movement. And that answer honestly is a work in progress. It's not easy. That's the final chapter of the book we're working on is how does one help bring back people who've lost that mooring uh, with reality? Uh, and it's it's the hardest chapter we've had to write. We're, we're kind of stuck on it, to be honest. Great, thank you. I think this next question uh, dovetails nicely with, with the last, and this is from Ian, and, and he asks, what role should universities play in responding to gaslighting? For example, or for instance, do members of intellectual communities, students, teachers, administrators, et cetera, have a special responsibility to step into the Charlie Brown role? I think it's very, I love that question. And I think that it does, it, 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 the question is whether it's a microcosm of what I just said about movements. And I worry it's not because uh, at least my empirical colleagues, I mean, I'm the political theorist, the odd duck in a political science department, but um, their commitment to being something much closer to the individual that is committed as a scholar to hewing to the evidence, right? Um, and of course, in their political lives, that could differ, but in the classroom, uh, I think it's so important for them to honor that, what I'd call the hard-nosed empiricism, uh, what's called, um, you know, it just, it's, it's that, that's, that's the most appropriate stance that, that we often take in the context of at least the social science division of a university. And so then the question is whether in a co-curricular setting, we can encourage events uh, that bring out the different ways uh, that we might have permission to have slack about the evidence. So when, as advisors, we, we advise student groups, which I'm involved in, uh, when I, now that I've moved my family into one of the houses here and we're dorm parents, I'm seeing a very different perspective on how we can, as academics, relate to students who actually really uh, come with us with causes that sometimes look like uh, the deck is stacked against them. I don't see how you're going to get this many deans to sign on to it, or when they're outward looking, which they often are, from the Kennedy School or undergraduates at the Institute of Politics here. Um, there I feel like my role is different than in the classroom. 
So there's, there's kind of a code switching that I believe that we have to do that I'm, I'm kind of learning as, as I go. But I used to pride myself that in the classroom, I would want students to never be able to guess um, any kind of political orientation. And I still stand by that in the following sense. I think that I would not want them to know, um, you know, ideally, uh, something like parties, uh, you know, party membership um, and candidates in particular. But I do, th I would want them to know that, you know, every year I teach students uh, who are part of the DACA program. And if they weren't sure, they, if they thought that, well, I'm not sure if, if my professor wants me to be deported, <laughs> I think pedagogically, I wouldn't be able to connect with them. So I think there are limits to that um, uh, that kind of neutral uh, position in the classroom. Uh, but I, but I, I would mostly stress it's the, it's the way we divide up labor between curricular and non-curricular. That seems to be the, the best route. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Uh, so it looks like we have a follow-up question to that. So, um, it, it, and it reads as follows. If social scientists must be hard-nosed realists, should there be some professors that teach students to be dreamers? Mm, right. Do we just outsource that to the philosophers over in the humanities, <laughs> right? Or the or the English departments? So, yeah, I don't. I, once you ask it that way, that would dissatisfy me if we if that kind of offshoring happened. I think there has to be a place uh, within a social science department to uh, to bring that out. I think we do bring it out in the sense that all of our research, even of the most, um, and I would call them evidentialist colleagues, right? That's, I mean, that's the official term of the epistemology. Evidentialist is someone who's, whose beliefs and, and evidence are extremely tight knit. And of course, you know, I, I think I, what I have is I feel like I have a series of colleagues. I think Theta Scotchpole, you know, um, I think of uh, Daniel Carpenter who um, are able to do that, right? That they're, of course their work is, driven in issue selection by values. And that's, that's all of our work is. Um, and so I think it's, I would focus on the stages of social science. So I think we can teach students to be dreamers when they're thinking about a big thesis topic, a big long form project. And we realize that they're talking to us at office hours, of course, their values they're, they're, are incredibly engaged. Why would they work on a subject like inequality or um, capital flight if, if, they, if they didn't care, right? But I think at that stage, that's where we, we have to teach, even as social scientists, the kind of dreamer side. How big can you think about what you want to take on? But then when we get to the way we're going to conduct that research, the way we're going to process the results, um, there I think we might have to have a different kind of attitude towards it. So maybe it's iterated within the research process, and we don't have to, to simply say, go off and take uh, my colleague uh, Michael Sandel's justice course. Or, you know, that, that, that seems like it would be it's an overly rigid picture of what, what we're about in social science. Wonderful, thank you. Um, our next question is from John Yoon, and he asks, how are audacious beliefs or collective self-efficacy related to the virtue of hope in civic life? I think they're what undergird it, right? Uh, that, and I think it's, it's important to kind of, that this was all very abbreviated. Um, and that when we ask, how could someone have uh, hope when it, their cause looks hopeless? Or how could someone vote for a candidate when they're told the day before that they're getting um, marginally small, you know, vanishingly small uh, uh, support, at least in the initial polling? And people still do that. They still vote for candidates who don't seem to have good chances. They still participate in causes that they think are likely to only succeed at best long after they're dead. Why would people do that? And I think there uh, I would have to tell a story about um, the underlying way in which, at least as we, as I cited uh, the important grit book, uh, the lowering, you know, sort of in some ways raising the evidential threshold. So the, the evidence it would take for me to give up my cause has to be much more powerful than sort of run of the mill polling or other kinds of data that looks against me. I mean, think of what if you'd taken the pollster data in Georgia um, in the runoff election, if that was playing a dominant role, you might have not gotten that outcome. Um, and that applies to both sides who wanted to win. It's, it's more about how does one take seriously real-time description of support for a cause or opposition to a cause? And, and the answer is you have to temper it. Now, I don't wanna go the Canadian route as I understand it, where you actually ban a certain amount of public polling before an election, because you in some ways wanna lower the veil and make people you know, protected from the, the hard empirical reality. I think that's not the right way to handle it. I think it's an overly paternalistic 
way to treat citizens. Uh, but I also think that we then have it, the onus on us uh, to process information that does suggest that our cause is unlikely to win or that we're unlikely to even make it past the first 10 miles of the marathon. That it's that kind of resistance to evidence that I, I think we need to tell a story about. And I think hope is parasitic upon that, right? That it, it actually demands that. Uh, and if I, I would recommend um, King's private journals that bring out to what extent, you know, when he thought about uh, the nonviolent, sort of absolutist nonviolent view, in public, he said, look, that's the only empirical way for this to work. He kind of made an instrumental claim on behalf of nonviolence. He also made a moral claim. But actually, if you look at behind the scenes, it wasn't that simple. He realized that there were tremendous risks he was taking by, by having a, such an absolutist position towards violence. And uh, his thought was that it was kind of a moonshot idea, right? I mean, just like the announcement that Kennedy made, you know, we will bring a man to the moon, uh, that seemed at the time absurd. Ike, when he heard it, uh, said it was one of the most ridiculous utterances he'd ever, you know, heard in public life. You know, that's the kind of hope resistance, right, that one would have if they were overly evidentialist in this setting, right? And so I think that's uh, something that we, we can protect ourselves against. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, our, our next question is from uh, Harper Shanley, who writes, uh, what advice would you give to political leaders in the United States to stray away from these means of manipulation and more towards collectivity as a nation? Yeah, yeah. I've really been thinking about how, right, how this translates into uh, ordinary electioneering, which is something that I've worked on for a while now. And I think the canvasser example I gave points the direction towards it. But I, I like that example in part because it's not, uh, it is a leader, but it's a local leader. It's someone making the neighborhood stops. And then I would ask the question of how does that scale to elite, elites with much bigger megaphones, which with many millions of followers, uh, and how can they in that setting appreciate the hazards? And I think that's the first step, and that to realize that the kind of facsimile intimacy that people experience in social media is reminiscent of the radio. It's actually much more intimate, I think, than, than broadcast television. And so to realize that this channel of communication is one where it is easier to engage in this kind of manipulation because people believe that they're in a pairwise relationship with uh, the person they're subscribing to. Uh, and it they have more interaction with that person, interaction obviously in scare quotes, than many of their friends. In a typical day, they might get a dozen tweets from that person. And so that then creates this sense that we have this intimate connection. And of course, that can be, a, like I said earlier, a feature that, to, that you can, you can uh, utilize that uh, to bring out a sense of collective efficacy, but you can also very easily, and I think without fully realizing what you're doing, follow into it. I was very surprised as I listened to these uh, fireside chats that they, that they turned in this direction. And obviously I have to make the evidence for it. I mostly, I just telegraphed it, but, um, we try to argue something similar happened in the context of Lincoln Douglas debates. I mean, there were so many, they were three hours each and they began much more uh, optimistically tapping in the, in the, the hope uh, style beliefs of, of those listening. Of course, it's not clear how many were able to actually hear Lincoln Douglas in those settings, but they, you know, but I think that as, and this may be another lesson, um, as leaders get exhausted from politics, which current politics, we've, we've designed it, so it is truly, uh, it is akin to a marathon, uh, that their defenses, it, it becomes much more tempting to use this kind of technique because it's easier, it's cheap. It can lead to, as I said, a sort of batch delete and knowing that you're not allowed to use it. In particular, when your opponent might be using it is a particular challenge. And that's one that, that I is a kind of note to self, I wanna work on that. You know, I haven't argued that gaslighting is never allowed, right? I've argued that it is a defeasible wrong, and it's often a very grave wrong, uh, but in an electoral setting uh, where one experiences it, is there any condition under which one is then licensed to respond in kind? I'm not committed to that view, but I haven't foreclosed it. And I think that's perhaps the most tempting moment for the, the question raises, is that if, if I have to unilaterally disarm this kind of manipulation, um, is this going to doom me to be uh, out of power in, in a state like this that is so hyperpolarized that has this rich, you know, oxygen environment as a metaphor? So I, in some ways, I've just kind of taken the question as 
is a very difficult uh, challenge. Uh, how do you respond when it's so tempting to deploy this? And I hope I've shown that it is in some ways part of the explanation of why a term that's from an obscure play and a movie that no, no one is on, on Twitter, these are younger generation typically have seen, has had millions of usages in peak days on social media. I just think it's part of our responsibility as, as political theorists, as social scientists, to kind of give the best explanation. What are they trying to do with this term of moral abuse? And uh, this is just an early draft of that attempt to make sense of what people are actually saying in politics. Wonderful, thank you, Eric. This is really fascinating. So I do wanna note that we have about five minutes left before we're gonna take a break and then continue with our panel discussion at 5.30. So if you have any questions you wanna make sure to get in, go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. We still have a lot to get through, so we're not gonna get to all of them, uh, but uh, thanks to all of you who have presented your questions. Uh, the next one is from Bonnie Green. Um, how can an individual with absolute irrefutable facts that fit in either partisan paradigm effectively communicate so that we could come back to some level of reality. Right, so the, uh, the example I gave where it may not be like the stove case, where one can find another route back uh, because you can ask whether you clean the stove. And, and so that uh, raises the issue of, can one actually be lost? I took the question to be you know, asking, you know, is, um, and I, as, a, as an optimist, maybe that's part of behind this research, I. I I can't admit that kind of defeat. I think that um, you know that it, it's true that, that in the even in the in the in the film in the play in the movie, um, there is at the end the, the possibility of redemption, right? That um, and the question is how overwhelming and how variegated must the evidence be for one to realize I was in the grip of a particular kind of manipulator? Um, and I think that I mean because that is what happens in the original storyline, it does give us a kind of point of direction, which is that an overwhelming kind of intervention, whether by friends and family uh, or fellow, uh, I don't want to say partisans, because in fact, it would be much better if it was a bipartisan <laughs> intervention. Uh, but uh, that, that seems to be at the very intimate, sort of local level, what, what it might take. And obviously, I haven't said how it worked, but I do think the model of an intervention probably uh, in the case of substance abuse is not a terrible one to work off of. I guess the question that I would leave is whether there's a collective analog to that. You know, are there moments when we experience as a nation events that are so, uh, so scarring and powerful that it actually leads to fundamental questioning in this kind of dependence relationship I've described? And I think it's too early whether the capital insurrection had that effect. Um, and, I, and I think that, um, but I think there's some early evidence that it did. Um, and I wanna be absolutely clear that now that there's democratic control uh, of Washington, uh, there's, pl there's plenty of other ways this manipulation can occur. Uh, we stress uh, in this work that um, there's no proprietary monopoly on this kind of manipulation. And that's why we actually have more, some more democratic characters in American history than Republicans who are making these cameo appearances uh, in the work. But I would suggest that when you, when you have um, uh, such a, a sort of powerful um, and shocking moment in, in our civic history to see that picture. And I, I, when I look for pictures for this talk to see the, the one at night, right? With the, uh, and to, to, which reminds you of how long it was, the insurrection took, you know, how long and how undefended we were. Um, and then for people to, and then in the other side of it, uh, NPR has put together a database of every individual person who's been arrested and not just the crimes they're charged with, but the, what their social media said. And um, I think I wasn't able to go through it here, but uh, there's some pretty powerful evidence of manipulation. And I, I actually think part of the story here is that we focus too much upon people self-deceiving, self-manipulating, going down a QAnon or some other conspiratorial route. I think this is much more of a third party wrong, wrongdoing. I think there's much less blame to be had, or at least there's collective you know, kind of complicity charges that occur, and we, whereas people often say, well, they went down the rabbit hole. Well, that implies that they weren't um, being led uh, by, by very powerful actors. So I'm in some ways trying to correct against that line, which, which at least I, I sometimes get the sense of. That doesn't absolve anyone of blame 
who, who led to the death of a capital cop or anything like that. Uh, but it does suggest that we have the, the kind of moral reckoning after it is going to be more complex. It will involve um, a, a distributing blame and, and, and guilt and complicity across a greater number of actors than maybe the story sometimes is brought out. Fantastic. So um, I really like this next question. So I know we're out of time. I'm going to ask it and maybe you can give just a very quick response to it. Um, but it, it it's an interesting one. It's from Richard Allman. And, and he asks, how important is a strong commitment to free speech in the prevention of gas lighting? How might we mandate equal time for debate when there are different interpretations of available evidence? There's a long history in which the interpretations of the elite smart group has been wrong and it delayed the advancement of science, the discovery of truth. He then cites example of um, peptic ulcers, um, which was denied for a long time until science proved it. So is there something that we can do to ensure that different perspectives are put on display in a way that's consistent with free speech? And yeah, the kind of dogmatic dependence that uh, that relationship I've talked about that can occur uh, within gaslighting it does suggest uh, that that's, that's a paramount view of free speech. Uh, and on campus, I'm part of a group that's trying to encourage that. Uh, uh, but, but I think that can sometimes cut against the, the equal time or the fair time constraints, right? That in some ways it brings out two ways to respond to the problem. Uh, one says, you know, one makes, I think, a, maybe a mistaken appeal to marketplace of ideas, right? Idea, just can let as many groups speak as they want. And the counter one says, no, have events that require multiple sides. And I think, uh, I can't arbitrate among that, but you would have to ask whether those two kinds of environments, which one is more likely uh, to help uh, correct against this, would hold people accountable. Um, and uh, yeah, I take that as a future work to do on what are these struct deliberative structures that we need that take seriously uh, the, the threat that I talked about. So thank you for that. Great, fantastic. Well, just an amazing presentation. Timely, engaging, relevant for this conference. Thank you so much, Eric. And thank you to those who asked questions. Sorry we didn't get to everybody, but we're glad you're engaged. And uh, thank you for being here and for presenting your questions. Um, thank you, thank you, Eric. So now we are gonna take a quick break. You're gonna see a screen come on that says, we'll be right back. Um, we will be right back with a panel discussion that will focus on character and public life. Um, our provost here at Wake Forest Road and Kirsch will moderate this discussion and it will feature uh, Donna Edwards, former member of Congress, um, Bill Haslam, former governor of Tennessee and Sabil Rahman, a senior counselor at OMB, former president of Demos. Um, so we'll be back at 5.30. So feel free to just stay here. Um, if you need to go away, you can find the link in your email, but we'll be back at 5.30 to begin our panel discussion on character and public life. Thank you and see Hello and welcome back. If you're coming back or welcome for the first time, if this is your first session, we've just heard a fantastic talk from Eric Bierbaum of Harvard University, as well as some engaging questions from the audience that followed. Uh, and now we're about to turn our attention to the character and public life panel discussion. And what I'm about to do is introduce Rogan Kirsch. Thank you, Rogan, who's just come onto the screen. Uh, Rogan is gonna be our moderator for this conversation to follow. Uh, Rogan is the provost uh, at Wake Forest University and professor of political science. Um, he has extraordinary experience in the academy as well as in politics himself. He has written over 50 academic articles, is a regular speaker in various media contexts, has worked in U.S. Congress, the British Parliament, and at think tanks around the world. He is an impressive scholar and a beloved teacher and a fantastic leader at Wake Forest and in the broader community. And we're really grateful, Rogan, to have you with us today moderating this conversation. So welcome to give you uh, all in the audience a, a heads up as to what's gonna happen. Rogan is gonna introduce our panelists and then there will be a free flowing conversation with the panelists. We just finished a Q&A, but as a reminder for those who heard this earlier, or if you didn't, I'm letting you know now, there won't be an audience Q&A component to this part of the panel discussion. Right. And then at the end, I'll pop back on for just a moment to wrap things up. But I'm about to hand it on over to Provost uh, Dr. Rogan Kirsch. All yours. Welcome. Yes, and welcome all. Big thanks to the Program for Leadership and Character at Wake Forest, as well as the Oxford Character Project for this really signal three days that are to follow and how well begun we already are. Let me do as Kenneth promised and introduce these fabulous panelists, Donna Edwards, is a former U.S. representative for Maryland's 4th Congressional District and a member of the Democratic Party in Congress from 2008 to 2017. She served on the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission 
and the Committees on Transportation Infrastructure, Science and Technology, and most pertinent for our work today, the Committee on Ethics. Representative Edwards is also a vital member of the Board of Trustees here at Wake Forest. Bill Haslam is a successful businessman and the former governor of Tennessee. He's a member of the Republican Party, so we've got great cross-party bipartisan conversation going on here today. Serving as mayor of Knoxville from 2003 to 2011, he was elected governor of Tennessee in 2010. Four years later, he won re-election by the largest margin in modern Tennessee history. K. Sabil Rahman is the newly appointed senior counselor in the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the Office of Management and Budget, the core mighty office in the, um, in the West Wing of the White House. He's on leave from Brooklyn Law School where he's an associate professor. He was also, as Kenneth said earlier, the president of Demos um, for the last four years, the think and do tank that drives so many progressive ideas in Washington. All right. Fellow panelists, I am so deeply honored to be here with each of you. As Ed Brooks um, of the Oxford Character Project put in his introduction, you are wise leaders and ethical thinkers of the utmost quality. And let's get right to it. Professor Beerbohm, as he began his talk, described political ethics as, he, as an oxymoronic project. That view, of course, has a long history in this and many other countries. The public views those engaged in political life as, at least collectively, possessing dubious character at best. Elected officials and bureaucrats habitually score at the bottom on public ratings of ethics of various professional um, realms. To each of you, a two-part question to start. As you served or serve in public office, how did you deal with such cynicism from your constituents, from those you were seeking to serve? And what advice do you have for young people in this audience who might be attracted to a career in public life but turned off by the unrelenting negativity from so many fellow Americans of both parties about the profession of public service. Representative Edwards, we'll start with you. Wow, Rogan, it hurts my heart to hear those uh, statistics. Um, I, look, I think that when you come to public life, you don't invent your ethics and your character. It's what you bring to it. And I think the jobs themselves um, help you reveal yourself. And, you know, my experience is that um, most people who choose to serve or chose with whom I served in the, in the Congress had high ethical standards and, you know, great, um, you know, sort of character compasses. And then you would have the, I think, exceptions and, uh, the public really gets to see that. It's what's in the headlines. It's, you know, sort of what they see. And in some ways, it becomes how they define um, our various institutions. And I think it's really unfortunate because I don't think that completely represents, um, you know, what people bring to the table. And I know for me, um, Congress was not going to change who I am. It was going to help me better define it to those who were seeing me for the first time. And it would help, and it helped me to clarify my values and my standards. That's powerfully said, and I love the rebuttal inherent in the question. Governor Haslam, same question about how you dealt with such cynicism when you were in public office and what advice might you have for young folks who'd love to follow in your footsteps? Well, first of all, I agree with Donna and it, it, I'm like her, it hurts to hear that. Uh, my first advice to people who would like to do this is do it. Uh, it is almost hard to quantify the difference it makes to serve in government. I always thought it was important before I started. And after having served uh, 15 years in public office, I'd say it's even more important than I thought it was. Um, I think that people think about ethics in terms of, are they doing something for personal profit or gain? I actually think that what I would encourage people to think about is forget about so much that you obviously have to think about people where they are in the political spectrum, but think about, is this somebody who really is trying to make a difference in what they're, by, by what they're doing, or are they there because they like playing the role? As is, is, is somebody said, uh, you know, I know some people say, well, I'm not a real senator, I just play one on TV, or I'm not a real congressperson, I just play one on TV, and I'm afraid that's what a lot of folks are doing. So I think that I would encourage people to think of it, ethics broader than just are they looking for some personal gain uh, that's, you know, monetarily based and think of it in terms of 
uh, are they there because they really do care about the common good or is it more of a, I'm here because I love the politics of it? I also love that frame. Thanks for uh, dovetailing so neatly with Representative Edwards. Senior Counselor Rahman. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kirch, and uh, thank you to uh, Congresswoman Edwards and Governor Haslam. It's a real uh, privilege to be on this panel with you both, and uh, thanks, Professor Bierbaum. Uh, I should say I'm a former student of Professor Bierbaum, so it's been a, a, a double treat to hear his lectures again in this forum. Um, so, you know, I appreciate this question, and I should say, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not an elected official, right? I serve uh, in uh, in the Office of Management and Budget, speaking here in my personal capacity. Uh, but I, I would want to maybe put some uh, kind of reframe the, the question a little bit, right? Because you know, the the frustration that I think you spoke to, uh, Professor Kirsch, is it can be projected at an individual level, but I think it speaks also to some of the broader structural challenges that our democracy faces. The kinds of challenges that uh, Eric Biron was talking about in his lecture, right? And so when I think about public service in this in this regard, I think two things would be worth really highlighting. One is just are, how do we help uh, create pipelines for public servants who are deeply rooted in the communities themselves, right? Who are who uh, have those relationships, who are tied to communities that are struggling in different ways, and have have an authentic voice, right? For those who really need representation uh, and uh, and a seat at the table, in, whether it's in Washington or in state capitals or in city halls. Uh, the second thing is. What are those institutional changes we need to pursue to 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 shorten that that gap, right? That that huge gulf between government as a as an entity out there that we don't really know what's going on and we don't really trust what government does and and us because you know Franklin Roosevelt uh, used to famously say that government is us. Government is the people. We are a democracy. But so much of our lived reality is not democratic, right? We whether it's campaign finance or uh, issues of voter suppression uh, or kind of these deep systemic questions around racial and gender inequity uh, and injustice. So I would really want us to think about a get involved absolutely, but b how can we be involved in different ways in elected office in social and grassroots movements uh, in community service of different forms that actually change the institutions to make us a more uh, uh, trusting small d democratic society. I love this differential way you've each approached this. Um, you had advice for fellow political leaders, you had advice for Americans as a whole, um, had advice for thinking about the particular issues that are involved in this way. And I'm gonna shake things up a bit. And as opposed to putting questions to all three of you, I'll come back to that. I'm gonna ask a personal question of each of you, you fellow panelists are of course, welcome to add follow-ups or rebuttals. I'm gonna go in the reverse order from how he opens. So Senior Counselor Raman, Raman you're up again. I've actually taught your terrific book, Civic Power in Classes, which suggests that we face a crisis in American democracy and that there is hope for renewal. And you've got lots of wonderful ways of thinking that through. I'd like to ask you to focus on how character might or might not play a role both in the crisis we face that I think many of you are, these audience members may share and how character might play a role in the hope for renewal that you hold out towards the latter part of the book. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And uh, I know my co-author, uh, Holly Russin Gilman, will be excited to hear that as well. Um, you know, I think uh, character, one way to think about character, especially now as I'm learning in my new role, right, in, uh, uh, in government, uh, as well as in my previous role um, in the advocacy world, I think character really is also a lot about uh, what's, how do you think about judgment in, under moments of pressure and under moments of uncertainty? Right, so like we can, you know, as the academic in me would love to, you know, spend a lot of time researching and built and thinking, looking at the data, looking at the evidence, thinking about, you know, what's the right response in a in a moment. But of course, in when you're confronted with it, right, there's so much that's moving fast in real time. There's really no substitute for individual judgment. And so when we think about what character means in you know, when you cash it out, I, I think it's those it's those like mental heuristics in your mind that you know when you're faced with a a, a decision or when you're faced with an, a new situation, what are the questions that you're asking? And who are the people who you're thinking of when you're asking those questions, right? And uh, when we talk about the, the virtues of public service, I think it really kind of boils down to um, us building the mental muscle, the character, the virtues, if you will, uh, to ask certain questions, right? Who is most affected? Whose voice needs to be heard that isn't heard in this moment? What are the things that I might be doing wrong 
uh, that you know are, are sort of my own natural inclinations, but actually, you know, I have my own limitations just like anybody else. And so, like, what are ways that I can build muscle to to check that against my own instincts, right? And so that's easy to say, hard to do, uh, but I think that it's in those mo gray areas where uh, what we're talking about is character. I think really come out. That's a again a wonderful frame. This idea that it's a individual judgment in a moment of crisis and uncertainty. I want to come back to that later, but. Thanks for uh, that one distillation of, again, what is a terrific book. I know you've got a new project that takes up some of the same themes, but uh, I, I really enjoyed reading and teaching Civic Power. Governor Haslam, you won your first political race for Knoxville mayor and weathered some pretty tough personal attacks from your opponent, Madeleine Rogero, I think is the last name. Um, you na later named her as a key city official working in your mayor's cabinet. And in fact, she succeeded you as mayor. What inspired that decision to name, again, a, a opponent who attacked you personally, um, which won you statewide and even national acclaim for what the Wall Street Journal called a remarkable act of character. Well, uh, the reality is that Madeline, uh, it's Rojero is her, is her name. Uh, I, I, we had a, a great need for somebody to do community development within the city. And I knew sh that she was the best person in the city to do that. And campaigns are interesting uh, is, uh, Cong as the congresswoman will tell you, they're, they're interesting uh, personal experiences. Uh, if you've never been that, that, the vulnerability of being a candidate is hard to describe. And I think sometimes with campaigns, when they're over, it's best to say they're over and what's the best thing now for the city or the state or the country or who, whatever the role you're playing is. So in, in my case, uh, I just knew that we had a big need. Um, that role was somebody that took the federal funds that came into the city and um, and really helped address a lot of the social and community building needs we had in the community. Madeline had a 25 year history of doing that. I knew she'd be terrific. Uh, and I'm really glad I put her in that position. And she ended up, like I said, our, our politics are really different, but she ended up being a terrific mayor herself for eight years. So the Lincolnian team of rivals move was um, not foremost in your <laughs> mind, but uh, that I remember is how it got cast at the time. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Representative Edwards, in Congress, you were known as a particularly ethical legislator. And I remember one moment uh, when you were arrested along with John Lewis during a protest against genocide in Darfur. What main influences, whether people or religious views or philosophical principles, sustained your deep commitment to doing the right thing? You know, I have to attribute that to my parents. I mean, my dad um, was in the Air Force. Um, he served for almost 30 years. And I think I can't even remember a moment in the time that I was growing up uh, between my mother and father where they were not emphasizing things like integrity and honesty and um, and responsibility and taking responsibility even when, you know, it was a really bad outcome. Uh, for you. And those things stuck stuck with me. And I always viewed myself, especially as a leader, both as a community leader, but also in the Congress as somebody who, you know, just wanted to call it what it was and, you know, not do a lot of sugarcoating. I was never very good at that. I'm not good at that now. And, um, and I think that uh, always being really comfortable in who I am. And I think that's an important quality of, uh, you know, sort of a character quality, a leadership quality, um, because if you have people who are mer mercurial and can change on a dime, uh, it doesn't really serve it for me anyway, it wouldn't have served my constituents well, but also it, it didn't serve my gut very well. And, um, and so I think it was easy. I think one of the most difficult things for me was serving on the ethics committee. I actually wanted to serve on the ethics committee. At the end of the day, it ended up probably being, you know, um, a little dicey when you're sitting in, you know, reviewing your, your colleagues and their, uh, and their behavior. But I thought it was important because I believe in our institutions. And I think that our institutions have been challenged, but they are strong. And I grew up believing in government and loving politics and, you know, thinking that government could do some good in people's lives. And I continue to have that, you know, kind of hopefulness. We are grateful that you do. Um, I can't help but 
having heard you talk so beautifully about your parents, ask your two fe fellow panelists if they'd quickly give a exemplar or a role model who helped shape your character, or at least your understanding and exercise of it. I'll, I'll go next. And um, you asked about uh, the, the situation with Madeline O'Hara. I'll give you a great story about my father. Uh, my father was a fairly prominent person in town, and there was a new editor of the newspaper. Uh, of one of the newspapers back when we used to have two newspapers in those days. Uh, and uh, this new editor decided he was going to come in and uh, shake things up. And he decided to, my father, like I said, was a very, was very involved a, a person in town and decided to go after him with what I thought then and still think were, were very unfair attacks. Well, the world changed a little bit and 10 years, this is, that was 30 years ago, about 10 years after that, I happened to be um, at my dad's office and I saw this editor who was now had moved, had, had left the paper, walk out of the office. And I said, Dad, what was he doing? He said, well, he wants me to help him find a new job. And I said, you're kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, so I'm, I'm shocked that he would ask and I'm shocked that you would help him. He said, oh, he's he's a good guy. He can uh, I, I really want to help him find the next step in his life. And to me, it was one of those moments of like, aha, that's. That's what grace in person looks like. Uh, and so I'm, I'm like, Donna, it's, it's easy. My, my, my best model was, was right in my own home. You are both so fortunate. That's wonderful to hear. Senior counselor. These are great stories. Um, you know, I think uh, we all have, have similar stories in terms of uh, the importance of, of family and role models. You know, I'll, uh, one I'll, I'll share really quickly, you know, I think for both of my parents as uh, expats, you know, we, we're we are a Bangladeshi, I'm a Bangladeshi American, uh, first of my family to be born in this country. Uh, my parents were sort of young, 20-something uh, radicals in their day as part of the independence movement in Bangladesh at the time, right, in the early 70s. And um, so much of uh, their formative experience was uh, listening to Dr. King and Malcolm X on Voice of America radio uh, as as they were thinking about you know, what was happening in, in, their, in, in their part of the world. Uh, and then me growing up hearing those stories, uh, but then being now here based in New York where we are still, um, but just knowing that these are uh, uh, kind of family commitments, but also global struggles, right? That um, the kinds of things that uh, they were inspired to then uh, work on in their lives were still very much the same struggles, right? That are that are alive even now, right? In, in so many ways. And so just having that personal connection to um, what is happening in the world is so important. Honored by all three of your stories about your parents, and I'm so glad we had a chance to get that in. I've been listening carefully, as I know our nearly 400 um, audience members for this fabulous panel have been as well, and I'm, I'm putting together a picture of what virtues or character traits are most important for professional success, especially, I think, for the young professional. We have many students on here. Here's what I'm hearing so far, if I could pick one out of each of your, your both stories and answers. Judgment, you suggested already, um, Sabeel, earlier on, that individual moment of judgment. Uh, Representative Edwards, consistency. You said how someone, and, and this is how you lived your congressional career, has to do the same and the right thing time after time. Governor Haslam, I heard forgiveness and grace in your stories. Is that a pretty accurate portrait? Would we agree as a panel on the virtues that might matter most, or do we need to add some things to it or subtract? You can question each other's if you like. Right now I've got judgment, consistency, and forgiveness. What do you all want to add or take away? Well, I think I would I'll never want to live, leave out. I'll um, jump in with one. Oh, go ahead. I know no, we, have this, we have this delay going, so uh, my I'm apologies, sorry. Governor Haslam. I mean, I never want to leave out integrity. Um, I, I, I just think that, you know, sort of who you are, and what you bring and staying true to that is so important to character. It is both what you hold on to internally and what people see externally. I, that's, that's hard to argue with. Uh, I think I'd add uh, humility. I, I've, I've made a vow to never hire any more narcissists. I don't care how great they are at their job, but if they're ego driven, uh, and I don't care if that's in academia, uh, government, business. I don't care how strong they are. They're not worth it. Uh, and so I've just kind of made a 
personal pledge. You, you could be the, the best person in the world for that job, but if, if you're a narcissist, I just or I know I just would don't would rather you not be on our team. All of us who hire regularly for whatever institutions we part of are going to seek you out afterwards to get your narcissist <laughs> filter test, so we so we can tell in advance. Um, Senior Counselor, you want to add anything to this? You started yeah. us off with this powerful judgment claim. No, I, I love this. Um, I'll maybe piggyback off of uh, off of both in, integrity and humility, and add uh, another wrinkle to that, which is, um, you know, and I think of this as as both integrity and humility in a different way, uh, n- knowing what you don't know. And uh, being really, really open to the to the fact that that real experts might not be the kind of credentialed card carrying ones, but are going to be folks who you know are living the experiences that you're trying to to work with and and help uh, help think through. So you know when I worked at uh, when I started at Demos, one of the things we would often say, even though we were a think tank, is uh, the real experts are actually not the think tankers, right? The real experts are uh, folks in their communities who know the the deep realities and the deep systems that need to change, right? And that we saw a lot of our job as being partners with folks who, uh, to help lift up their ideas and their voices, right? Because, and I think it's a, it's a bit, way of bit turning on its head. I think sometimes when we talk about, you know, the, the virtues of who, who, who gets to serve and who can serve, we, we might unintentionally imply that there, there are some folks who are, you know, better suited for that. But I think one of the values is really like us checking ourselves to remind ourselves that actually the best knowledge and best ideas and uh, most inspiring, you know, energy often comes in from other places. And your job is can maybe the best way you can do your job is to be a conduit for those ideas uh, and and those inspirations. A beautiful um, extended riff on humility and. I think we have five traits that uh, I have my text for my next, next class session. Let me, uh, we're, uh, we're approaching the halfway mark, um, I say painfully, because I'd love to go on for a good long while, but let me shift the frame a bit. And in fact, let's look at those virtues of character traits, judgment, consistency, forgiveness, integrity, humility. These are individual virtues, um, what some philosophers, philosophers call cowboy virtues, things you practice all by yourself out there on the prairie or the, wherever the cowboy is. In fact, this is so American. We view character as an individual matter more than most other countries. In fact, my character is rooted in my upbringing, my religious views and values, and my own sound or poor ethical judgments. But there's a contrary view. Political philosopher John Locke, who knew a thing or two about character, said centuries ago that humans are like chameleons. We take our hue and the color of our moral character from those who are around us. I wanna ask you each if that seems right, if in many situations, in fact, it's not our individual character that maybe it's, we tend to behave about as well as or poorly as those around us. That's an ethics of neighborliness or of the community. And if that's right, or at least partly right, how can we enhance the collective character of a group, the student body on a college campus or a law firm or the US Congress or the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the White House, in other words, if it's not just your character, but those around you that help shape the character of institution, how can we make places better? I'll, I'll take the first swing uh, and it, it'll, the, the, the wisdom will go in ascending order from here. Uh, I, I, I think it's, I think one of the things you have to realize in terms of uh, who we're surrounded with is not just obviously the character issue, but the sense that we as Americans are tending to clump more and more uh, and live and work and worship with people who think just like we do. And that uh, has its own impact on our character, not in the sense of deciding if you're going to steal a loaf of bread or not, but in uh, deciding that we're right, they're wrong, and we have all the answers. And if you ask me my biggest concern about the country, and I think it has has turned into a character issue, it's we're at each other's throats. And not only are we, I said, not only are we divided, but we're mad about it. And we think the other side has bad motives. And, you know, there's something called motivation, attribution, asymmetry that says, you know, how much do I not just disagree with you, but think you think what you do for for bad reasons. And supposedly, you know, as of even five years ago, and it's gotten worse, the motivation, attribution, asymmetry between 
the Republicans and Democrats in our country is greater than that between Palestinians and Israelis, which is kind of seen as the historic mark of, of, uh, of, of, of disagreement. So I think the thing I'd, I'd try to encourage people is um, we, we don't only, not only take on our character from the folks around us, but we, we, we assimilate our culture and those things that we assume to be right and wrong uh, and true and false. And we need to be aware that we're taking it from a very like-minded survey. A compelling statement against both the profound polarization of our moment and the fact that we tend to clump together with those who think, believe, and so on like ourselves. Um, an interesting, again, shift away from the individual entirely character point. Fellow panelists. Well, I mean, I really do believe in institutions. And I think where people might change, when we strengthen our institutions, those are the things that can, you know, move from one generation to the next. And, you know, and I worry that um, so many of the institutions that we, you know, that were our gathering places, whether you know, that was a gathering place that was um, was Congress under a different set of rules where people spent more time together and they got to know each other and then they got to do, um, you know, do the policy making. Or it's the union hall where everybody who, you know, sort of work, they may come from different households, but they have some place to, uh, to gather. And I think we've lost some of those kind of institutions where we're able to find more in common. Um, Professor Hirsch, you uh, know this, but uh, when I came out of Congress, I got in an RV and drove around the country for about four months. And I was in every part of the country that you can imagine in rural areas and urban areas. And I talked to lots of people. And, you know, the minute you take off all of the various hats that we wear, we really do find that we share so much in common. But our political space doesn't allow us to talk about those commonalities as much as we talk about the um, the differences. And I think that that, you know, causes the kinds of divisions and the, the sense that we don't actually have, you know, shared values and shared circumstances. And um, the way you, I think, change that is you begin to rebuild, you know, brick by brick um, some of these institutions. Uh, yeah, just poignantly to, and powerfully said. Go ahead, Sabiel, sorry. No, sorry, no, thank you. Uh, just to build on that, because I, I really, really agree with that. And um, I think so much of the collective nature of character, I think that, that you're getting at with, with this prompt, uh, has to do with who you're in community with. And oftentimes the the people you're in community with, are it's you don't have a whole lot of say in that, right? Like it's your workplace, it's your colleagues, it's your... Um, it's, you know, where you happen to be born or where, where uh, you kind of folks you have on hand, you know, I think just even in, in my own experience, I've been really lucky to have tremendous colleagues who I've learned so much from in each institution that I've been a part of. But just to what Representative Edwards was just saying, like, I think at a macro level, we could do a lot more to help sustain and support those institutions, whether they're political institutions or civil society institutions that are essential to creating those types of common bonds, uh, uh, but also to help keeping folks tethered to what, uh, you know, the communities that they're they're a part of and trying to serve, right? I think some of the, some of that cynicism that you know, we started the conversation with, I think in part comes from the fact that we have uh, policymakers or, or government of, uh, or um, corporate, uh, corporate CEOs or, you know, whatever folks who have a lot of pull um, who may or may not be as tethered as they could be or, or ought to be to uh, the communities that, that uh, they're serving and a part of. And that has to do with these institutions that I think Rep. Edwards is talking about. Can, can I jump in with one thing real quick? Uh, Absolutely. This is, uh, this is tight. This is not, this isn't your question, but it's just something that I, I've, no, I don't teach as much as, as many people on this uh, on this uh, call do, but uh, when I teach in, in college classes, I'm always struck by how quickly folks are willing to talk about institutional brokenness, institutional racism, et cetera, which is not to be minimized. But I think sometimes we use that as a uh, as an escape from our personal responsibility within that, from our 
you know, from individual racism is, is a lot harder to, to address than systemic racism. And uh, the same thing with brokenness, the brokenness of our institutions in a lot of ways. So uh, I, well, I, I, I think it is important to talk about the, the character of institutions along the lines of your question. I don't ever want us to, to always say it's, 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 it's the system's fault. Um, it's not, it's not, I'm, I'm not part of the problem. You know, so, Governor Haslam, I, I agree with that. I do think that, um, you know, it also has to do with building this sense that we are our institutions. Our institutions are not some third party out there. Our government is not some third party out there. And if it's broken and it's fallen apart, then I have a responsibility to try to fix it because, you know, if I'm not, I'm part of uh, part of the problem. I think, you know, I know when I was uh, when I was in Congress and uh, served on on ethics, it was the ethics committee was always seen as something, you know, this sort of ostrich over on the on the side. And really, what the real the reason for it is to maintain the integrity of the institution so that we don't lose that. It was about building the public character that we could all you know, hold to a standard, but I think each of us has a responsibility in whatever those institutions are. And keep in mind, these institutions were never perfect before and they're not perfect now. Well said. We weave together what is becoming a, a mighty strand, um, both the exchange or really the, the convergence, the two of you just beautifully expressed with, um, Sabil's idea of keeping people tethered to their communities. We live in what I think could be described as a staggeringly important moment for ethics and character in public life. We're amid and let us all pray emerging from a terrible pandemic. We've been through a pretty wild ride the last four years culminating in an insurrection at the institution in which you served, Representative Edwards. And I know other two of you were there frequently. We're also amid a mighty renewed movement for racial justice and equity in the wake of George Floyd's tragic death and so much that has been in the aftermath of the Black Lives Matter movement. What ethical guides can help us through this extraordinary moment we're in? I may have stumped us. No, go, go ahead. I can take a take a first crack, though. Um, you know, it's 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 an important and a challenging question. You know, I I think because so much of what we're facing with facing right now, I think, is a struggle between um, as folks are trying to sort of uh, can, uh, make meaning out of this incredibly difficult in so many ways, right? Even just this week, uh, uh, the latest violence in in Atlanta and what that means for uh, the AAPI community uh, and for so many of us, just still trying to find a place, right, in uh, in our country. Um, I think it's a couple things. I think one is just um, uh, feel, feeling the call to to serve, right? And 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 sort of thinking about this moment, as uh, Rep. Edwards was saying, you know, that it, it is us, right? There's, I think, things these systems can feel so vast, but they're a product of a million decisions that individuals make, that policymakers make, that companies make, and so there are levers that all of us are uh, have access to. Um, but we, we are able to do that if we act collectively. So I think it's uh, kind of one is just uh, feeling empowered to act, that these are things that we can change. This, but second, that thinking about how can I do that in a collective, like with others around me, others in my community, with, you know, we're, with many, we can be strong. Um, and then the, the third thing is that uh, we don't have to have the, the answer today, but I, I think we do have to all show up uh, in the fight, right? Because that's how we, we we kind of struggle our way through. Yeah, I spend a lot of time these days, as I'm sure you all do too, talking with young people uh, about the value of public service, because I think we've gone through you know, maybe a generation and a half of uh, people who, as Governor Haslam said earlier, maybe just are not there for the right reasons or they're there to serve themselves, but not really to serve the public. And we have to grow a new generation of leaders 
who want to serve because they believe in our democracy. They believe they have something to share and get them invested in that. And there are so many times when um, when I'm with young people who say, who really, you know, say how both broken the institutions are, but that they would reject any possibility of serving. And, you know, I think when I was a young person, I was looking at Barbara Jordan and Shirley Chisholm and, you know, and many others um, who were in public life thinking, I want to be them. Uh, so we've got to create that in this next generation. I'm going to piggyback on, on both of those thoughts. You know, our, our generation has become one that, you know, talks a lot and values self-actualization, kind of being your best you. You know, I want to be my best me. And I think it's so long from, you know, we're, we're 60 years from Kennedy at saying, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I know that sounds kind of, you know, sentimental and sappy in today's world, but that idea of the common good um, we've let go, and I don't. I don't think the folks like us on this call have stressed that enough. And it's become okay to think that, yeah, your your role in life is to to be your best you, instead of to how do you help make the this common society that you're a part of a better place. If I could just tack on one one more thing, just to that uh, thinking about the governor's comments. You know, I. Um, uh, as, as I guess when, uh, one of the, I'm, I'm in the upper bound of the millennial generation, so I'm, I'm, I don't think of myself any longer as a young person, but uh, uh, still young-ish uh, at heart. And, um, but I do think part of the struggle right now, is, you know, we're in, in some ways we're living in a moment of extraordinary, amazing activism, right? Just think about this last year, everything from the movement for Black Lives to uh, the climate, the climate, the movement for climate change, Sunrise Movement, uh, movements for immigrate immigration rights, democracy reform, there's so many things that are on the table. And you're seeing, you know, young people, uh, working class folks, people of color, they're, they're powering these movements. And that's amazing and tremendous. But I think the struggle is, um, it's so, uh, the issues are so existentially fraught and so real uh, in terms of the threats to people's safety and well-being uh, and to our community safety and well-being. And it's, it's not clear that we're going to be able to like solve some of these big problems, you know, tomorrow, right? And so, I think the challenge is, in some ways, uh, creating conduits for that energy and that urgency, right? How do we flow that into long the kinds of institutions that uh, Representative Edwards is talking about, or civil society organizations, uh, things that can out that are bigger than any one person, and then can outlast any one election or any one uh, campaign, right? That because. Those are the things that are that endure and then can have real impact over time. But I think there's, uh, so we're in a little bit of this moment where uh, I think there is a lot of hope out there, but there's also a lot of nervousness that, well, what if this doesn't work? And I think it's sort of on all of us to help make it work uh, so we can uh, kind of channel that forward. So as a college professor, I give you all an A for that really terrific sense of at least the framework for ethical guides that can help us through this time. And you've also you know, come up with a definition or at least a set of virtues that are most important for professional success. Let me try to channel all that into this question. There's a general sense, again, it's pretty strong in the individualist US. Governor Haslam totally take the point that there's you no know, great things about personal responsibility and sense of individualism. But, one of the offshoots of that is, and I think this is something the character project here at Wake Forest um, spends a lot of time thinking about, senses, you know, by the time you're in your, I don't know, late teens, your character's pretty well baked. Again, your parents, your religious influence or so on. Can we teach character? Can you educate people to have better character? Could we improve the character of the rising generation of professionals that you're all talking about? Each of you had a notion it's possible, but you also talked about, instead of educating directly, conduits for harnessing their energy or you know, ways of trying to restore a sense of shared purpose. Can we teach character and should we do so? You know what? I have to believe that there are things that we can teach that help to strengthen 
character. Because if you don't believe that, then you won't be believe that any of the brokenness can be fixed. And so I'm not willing to go there. Um, so I think that there are, I mean, there are tools that we can um, to, to give people. Um, and there are vehicles that we can give them to help to help keep keep people on the right track, um, and you know, and then that builds on or bolsters what they've already internalized, maybe in their in their teens. Encouraging. I, Thank I, you. I, I'm I'm on, yeah, I'm on Donna's team on this one. Uh, I, I think the the most important thing a leader can do, and I, and I'm defining leader in a broad sense here. Um, is define reality. And part of reality is that character matters. And we, to say that, you know, the 20 year old you're teaching in class or the 17 year old high school senior or the, the 30 year old, um, whatever, um, that to, to not emphasize that character matters is doing them a great disservice and is not defining reality. And I think our, our fear of doing that has led us to this, world we're in now where, you know, we can have people talking about uh, alter al alternate truths and some of the other uh, terms that have come out of DC in the last five years. I think Governor Haslam emphasizing that character matters is probably the mantra for this conference. So very glad you voiced it. Thank you. To be on this interesting question about whether we can teach or educate, let's say law students um, to enhance their character. Right. I mean, I was, as you're asking a question, I was thinking, you know, there, gosh, there, I, I hope it doesn't end at, at age 20 or whatever, because I feel like I'm still learning um, and have been learning so much, you know, from in Oxford and law school, uh, you know, working in the activism advocacy world, even now, you know, every day. Um, so I, I think, I think we're always actually learning and building character. We may not be aware of it and we may not be intentional about it. Um, and I think that's the that's the 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 twist is that character does matter, but therefore we need to be intentional about how do we support ourselves and support each other in cultivating, building, supporting the kind of virtues that we're talking about in in this conversation because that's an ongoing challenge. That's an ongoing investment. And having a community of you know friends, peers, colleagues, mentors, uh, you know, uh, people you admire, who you're learning from and observing from afar, right? These are the kinds of things that uh, help help sustain and deepen character over time. And um, and I, I think we, you know, we can be, all be more intentional about uh, about supporting each other in that. Again, I love what you guys are are without any you know preview or pre conversation are con converging on um, on on all these questions. Um, we also have about 15 minutes left. And, and unusually in my experience on these panels, we've got more people now than we did at the beginning. So we're gonna keep them hooked. Um, all right, character matters. We can enhance it intentionally. We've gotta keep people on the right track to quote the three of you. We've talked a lot about virtues in public life and how to teach them and enhance them. What vices are most dangerous or tempting in the contemporary, and we're going to stick with public life now in Congress and gubernatorial seats and the West Wing or in OERA over in the OEOB. What kinds of vices in contemporary United States are perhaps tempting us off the path of good character? I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I mean, well, we talked about this a little bit, but the the everybody is aware of the polarization um, and everybody is, you know, sees it and sees the detriment. But I think the, the vice is in not realizing what we talked about earlier, that um, we all have this desire to be told that we're right. And so we want to talk to people that think like we do. And I want to watch the news that gives the, the slant on it that I like. Uh, and the that vice is so much easier today when there's so many different news sources that I can choose my news and even my phone figures out what I want and gives me more of that news. And the vice of thinking uh, I'm right uh, and they're not only wrong, but they're wrong for, for bad reasons is uh, one that grips all of us in such a strong way. And 
one of the things when I talk to people who are executives with, you know, uh, with cable networks, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, you, you name it is. So we're always surprised how many people leave us on all day on loop because they want that constant reaffirmation that, yep, uh, what I think is right. And that person on TV keeps telling me that all, all, all day and night long. Yeah, I, you know, um, this is a really tough one because I think that I, I, for me, for me personally, bright lines are important when it comes to ethical behavior. And I, I think that there was a time, I think Governor Haslam and I share a birth year, we won't say what it is, but, um, you know, we had Walter Cronkite, you know, a couple of news stations all of us were kind of on the same page when we got our, our information and we don't have that now. And there isn't one, you know, sort of a voice out there that keeps us all on track. And so I think one of the vices has to be, you know, finding, if you can't find that common thread, then it all falls apart. You know, when we don't, you know, share that common sense of what's appropriate and what's not, what is ethical and what is not. Um, and I think that's where the damage to ourselves as individuals and to our institutions falls apart. Yeah, I really appreciate these these comments. Um, you know, I think uh, once I, I've been very lucky to have tremendous colleagues uh, in each of these, these spaces. So, you know, really great folks, um, you know, one thing I'll just lift up hearing both the governor and representative I was talking just now is that, um, you know, as we think about the information landscape, right, the vices in some ways are, are actually even deeper than at the individual level, they're systemic, right? It's, um, it has to do, like, there's a, there's a, a structure to how media operates today, how the platforms operate, what their profit motive is, you know, you make more money by getting more eyeballs and you get more eyeballs by, feeding more and more stuff like what people already see and more extreme versions of what they already like. And this is well documented uh, in terms of how the platforms work. So I just uh, offer that, you know, we, as we talk about uh, vices in our, in our public life, are there, what are the institutional changes we, want, we need to make as a country to how media operates, to how uh, elections operate, right? That actually draw down <laughs> the level of vice and encourage support uh, the kind of virtues we're talking about. Right, and just jumping on there, because you, you nailed it. And for all of us to realize that uh, outrage is a business strategy for media companies. Absolutely. So look, I spend a lot of time on television um, and on cable television. Uh, and I know that from the top of the day to the end of the day, the goal is to repeat, repeat, rinse, and repeat. Um, and I, I think part of the theory is that you have one audience at one time and another audience at another time. But the reality is, you know, for a set of people, that is all they're hearing all day long. And it really does reinforce whatever the vantage point um, they come from. And I think that in public life, we have to be careful not to feed into that. Um, you know, there are parts of me, for example, that love C-SPAN and love the idea that we have wall-to-wall -wall coverage of what goes on in Congress. On the other hand, I see more and more members who really are just playing to the camera in the, you know, in the hopes that they'll make it to the evening news or, you know, on a late night uh, feed or something. And I think all of those things diminish what we were talking about earlier, they diminish the institutions and they diminish the individuals who serve. Stirringly said, thank you. Um, I'd love to pick up another theme that actually each of you has used this word at various points. You've all talked about trust and when you think of social trust more broadly, um, Americans today and especially the youngest Americans, the rising generation that we hope will pass through our universities and high schools and um, save us all. Americans today, again, especially these youngest Americans, trust political figures less than at any time in our recent past. 
They trust nearly all institutions except the military less than they used to. We trust one another less, especially as Governor Haslam noted earlier, and from the opposite party. I think we all regret this, deplore it. Some of you have given some reasons for it, in fact, whether it's polarization or systemic violations and so on. We've all agreed we can teach character. Anybody have any idea how we can teach, especially these young people, to trust each other and to trust our institutions? I'll go first. One of the uh, one night, um, one of the things that happens uh, every year, regardless of who the president is, is uh, they have the president invites every governor and their spouse and most of the cabinet to the White House for a, a wonderful kind of five course dinner where you know it, it, it it's it's a beautiful black tie dinner. And um, I was sitting in President Obama's last year by someone. And, uh, and I won't, well known, I won't say it is, but who was a hardcore Democrat, had uh, been with Obama from the beginning, he had worked for the Democrat National Party before that. Uh, and I said, well, what do you know now that you wish you'd known eight years ago uh, when you started? He said, I wish I'd known how hard this is. Um, he said, I, believe me, he said, he said, I, he, said no, I mean, he said, I wish I'd known how hard this is. I wouldn't have given George Bush such a hard time. He said, I still don't agree with his policies. Don't get me wrong. But he said, this is a lot harder than it looks on TV. And um, I think if we could help communicate the difficulty of the decisions, I I'm going to botch the, the quote, but Martin Luther wrote, you know, he said, he said, don't send your best to be, to be preachers. The Holy Spirit does all the work there. Send your best to government because there it's where the ambiguities of life have to be wrestled with. And I, I, I botched the quote, it, it's something to that effect. Um, but that's what we have to communicate to people is, this is hard stuff. And getting the answers right um, is really difficult for the people who really wanna work to get the answers right. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, and I think I would just add the, core, the kind of uh, related piece to that is that, um, you know, trust has to be earned. Right. So like stuff like it's really important that we try to figure out a way to make some of these institutions work for community and deliver for communities so that that trust can be uh, can have some foundation and not just be, you know, something that we exhort folks to or, or you know, there's only so much you can trust on spec. Right. And so um, and I think it's related to what the governor was just saying. Right. Because it is really hard. Um, but uh, part of the disservice is if we if we don't uh, support folks through like muddling through the the ambiguities, right? But then but then actually try to uh, do the delivering for communities that need the help. You know, even if you disagree on policy, right? I think because I, I do think it's it's one thing to disagree on policy, uh, but still sustain the basic functioning of these institutions. Versus, you know, we uh, Professor Beerbaum talked about the the attacks on January six, like. Yeah, that is an attack on the very institution of the Congress and of our electoral system. And that, you know, we can't have that and still have a, a trust, a, a build trust in our in our institution. So I think we need to actually deliver for people who are struggling and, and show that working together through public service, through collective action actually can work. I, I, I agree with both of those um, both of those sentiments. Um, I think that uh, you know we have to be realistic about what is expected out of the political and policy making process. And I think I have been listening quite intently in this discussion over the last several weeks about bipartisanship and what bipartisanship means and. For too many people, bipartisanship just means let's not argue about stuff. And I don't think that's what it is at all. I think it's about, you know, sort of having, you know, a robust competitive debate around uh, policy issues and then figuring out ways that you can mix the sausage um, so that it comes out. And I think that we have somehow or other, we have instilled in people the idea that, um, you know, that we shouldn't even have policy debates. And I don't think that's how our system was designed to function. 
And I think that that minimizes the hard work that Governor Haslam described of what it means to govern. Uh, and we could do a lot better at teaching that so that the expectations that people have of what government can and, and will produce, it makes sense and that it's reasonable. Can I, I, I want to, I, I want to just add to that. I, I, they are both dead right. Uh, and Republicans have too often been, you know, the, the Ronald Reagan quote about, you know, government is not the answer to the problem. It is the problem. We've been guilty of that. Uh, Democrats have been, you know, saying, well, you're just not spending enough. I mean, you can, you can categorize it however you want. But the bottom of it, what Sabil and Donna both said is this stuff matters. You know, people hire the government, they hire us, they elect us to do something. And that is to produce uh, to services in return for the taxes they pay. Uh, and we have, we have not held that in high enough esteem. Yeah, I mean, it's hard when, you know, you beat up on, you know, government's been beaten up on for, you know, 30, 40 years to now say, well, government works. Well, no one's going to believe that. And you hear that reflected in our public dialogue and we have such low expectation. And maybe yeah. that's why we are in some cases electing people who, let's just say they're not um, living up to the highest bar the highest standard you incredibly fortunate folks in the audience have heard over the past hour a proud strong democrat longtime office holder and a proud strong republican longtime office holder and a washington bureaucrat <laughs> discuss some of the most <laughs> profound and important themes that exist at present You've heard about the importance of judgment and humility and forgiveness and consistency and grace and integrity. You've heard a former governor rip right off his tongue, motivation, attribution, asymmetry. <laughs> You've heard most important that character really matters. It can be enhanced, it can be taught, that trust can be encouraged, that folks can find their way past the extraordinary array of vices and stay on the right track. And you've heard, maybe most important of all, at this incredibly complex moment in American life, this historic juncture, that although working in public life, that working in what has long been called the noblest profession is really, really hard. And it can be profoundly rewarding. You've heard that from folks who've devoted their careers, devoted their lives, to this work. We're so grateful you were with us for the journey. And if there were applause possible on a Zoom screen, I'd ask you all to stand and applaud this amazing trio of public servants and inspirations for us all. Thank you. And what a wonderful conclusion to the first part of the first day of this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Provost Kirsch. Thank you so much, panel. This was amazing. I had people texting me throughout this panel saying things like, this is amazing. I want to follow up with you about this. How did you find these people? And I know that people all over the world are having similar reflections right now as they heard from you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking this time. I'm not going to try to put a cap on it any better than what Rogan just did, other than to say thank you. Here in just a moment, if you stick around just a few seconds, there's a link that's going to pop up in your uh, chat box that will take you to the seven o'clock um, screening of the face-to-face uh, -face partnership preview event featuring Madeline Albright and Colin Powell. So that starts at seven. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. In just a moment, that link, it looks like it's already in the chat box there. Um, feel free to follow that link. To be clear, the video conference that you're taking part in now, this Zoom call, will not take you to the Albright Powell event. You will need to hang up in a bit from this call and click on the link or go back to your email to click on that link in order to uh, make it to the 7 p.m. Albright Powell event. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope to see you again tomorrow morning. We'll start back up tomorrow morning um, at nine o'clock with the character and religious leadership session. So I hope to see uh, many of you, if not all of you there tomorrow morning. Thanks again to our panel and to our moderator, Rogan, uh, and hope to see you all at seven o'clock for the Albright Powell event. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good night.